We have about a dozen questions that people have asked through the Slack uh, previously. And then the idea is after that, I'm just gonna let people ask in the chat and we'll we'll see what we get. Um, the focus oh, here, good. yeah, it should be good. Uh, we just finished our first cohort through Advanced R and through the book club. Um, so the goal is to focus there, but we also have a cohort running, three cohorts running through um, R for data science right now. So uh, hopefully we get a wide range of questions in R coding. <laughs> Um, how do you continue to, to develop tools that are so effective for data scientists while not actually practicing data science? Um, are there things you do intentionally to keep your fingers on the pulse? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it used to be something I worried about a lot. Um, <laughs> I kind of stopped doing data science. Um, somehow, I mean, I still kind of dabble a bit. Um, so kind of the most recent project I worked on was um, doing some analysis of the uh, Studio Global talk submissions, oh, excellent. Um, which all go in um, a Google Sheet. <laughs> and then we kind of, we enter our decisions in a Google Sheet and then um, do kind of analysis after the fact to make sure we've um, done our best at um, picking good talks. So I, I still do a little bit. Um, otherwise, it's just like a lot of kind of listening to listening to people, hearing what the problems are, and then trying to reflect that back into into practice. Uh, I think the the other thing that's kind of surprisingly challenging is that a lot of what I do is say no to people. Like <laughs> people have lots of um, great ideas for things, and unfortunately, just a, a, most of the time, I sort of tell them no. Like not because the ideas aren't good. But because I think it's really important to kind of keep that like that that focus and that that core, which makes things easy to easy to understand. Makes sense. <laughs> All right. Um, so next up, we have what is your data science for business mental model? And I guess that's kind of related. Is there um, anything more to know. add to that? I don't know if I have. <laughs> model. Um, the data science of business, except that, um, you know, I think a lot of um, what I do is kind of the tools for like what I think of the sort of the easy part of data science, which is like, like actually like writing the, the code and describing what you want. The, the hard parts are like, you know, figuring out exactly like what question should you be asking like, where is the data? Is it the right data? How do you get the right data? And then once you've done the analysis, like how do you actually drive change within an organization? I think those are like the, the really hard parts of, of data science and something that I don't have much experience with. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and then the last one in this kind of family is um, basically when you, what do you use to decide whether you're going to say yes or no, basically? How do you decide what is worth working on? Uh, so, that's, me. yeah. I mean, it, it's really tough. Um, some of the decisions are really, uh, I'll tell you one thing. You should never file an issue when there's a multiple of 25 issues on the GitHub, because <laughs> if the issue kicks it over and just multiple, into two pages of issues, it's likely to be closed with extreme prejudice. <laughs> um, but more seriously, I mean, a, a lot of it is, um, you know, a lot of what I do is kind of batching. So, um, you know, I'm only actively working on normally like one or maybe two projects and the other ones are just collecting like issues. And so when it comes time to like work on a project, there's like a bunch of issues. And then it's a matter of like looking through them and um, saying, oh, actually there's like three issues here that are all really the same underlying issue. And that's clearly something that you know, is impacting multiple people. And then it's kind of a trade-off um, between like how, how like much work is it going to be to implement this thing versus how many people do I think it's going to, to impact? And you know that's that's obviously kind of a you know a bit of a guess on 
on both sides. But there are things that, you know, again, I totally think like this is a, you know, a great idea. Um, it would be great if, you know, things work this way, but it would just be an immense amount of work to actually make that change. And so I just, I just say like, you know, no. Um, you know, similarly, I, I don't believe like in issues being like this. I like, I don't, my, my philosophy for like issues on GitHub particular is that like issues are not like precious. They're not like these little mm -hmm. gems that if you throw them away, they'll never come back again. Um, my attitude is more if I like accidentally close something that is important, someone else will file another similar issue and they'll <laughs> like kick something off in my head. But so really a lot of it is just like accumulating like the weight of evidence and then kind of is this something that seems to be affecting like lots of people, not just one person with some, you know, particular situation. Makes sense. Um, so kind of on the other side of things, what is your process for learning a new topic? Um, is it different for R for, versus other things? And has the approach changed over many years of developing tools? Um, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I don't feel like there's that much more for me to learn about R. Um, I, you know, there, of course, there's always like a, occasionally weird little corners of R. I'm like, oh, that's that's weird. I've never encountered that. Um, it, it's, so it's really hard for me to like reflect on R just because that's something I've spent you know, so much of the last you know, 15 years thinking about. Um, I mean, I think otherwise, like, you know, so one thing I'm working on at the moment is dbplyr, which uh, translates dplyr code to SQL. And so, um, you know, SQL is something I'm like, you know, reasonably good at, but I don't use every day. Uh, and so a lot of um, the struggle with dbplyr is kind of like bringing like that, sort of activating that SQL mm -hmm. knowledge in my brain. So like one thing which I have on my <clears throat> desk right now is this like massive book which is SQL 99 complete really which like like do not go out and buy this book because for like 99% of uses it's awful um but it's like the one thing that actually defines or the closest thing that actually defines how SQL works uh a SQL is weird because there's like this ANSI standard that defines how SQL is supposed to work which like database you know, people who implement databases go and read and then try and do their best to follow. But that's not actually freely available. Like if you want a copy of like the actual ANSI SQL standard, it costs like $3,000 or something ridiculous, which even I am not willing to pay. And so like, this is my best, the best, the best thing I've found that like defines how does SQL work at a really low level. And I mean, I think in general, like that's what I've, found myself doing more and more over time is like going to like the source like I want to understand how these things are supposed to work like and then kind of build my mental model up from that like I, I really want to like I try and like read the specs um I mean, a lot of the time it's not reading them exhaustively uh it's skimming um so like you know this book I just kind of skim through I look up stuff that I'm wondering about it kind of says like this is what the standard is and then I'll go and like google like what, how does this work in MySQL? How does this work in SQLite? How does this work in Postgres? And then try and build up some kind of consensus model. Um, another kind of similar thing I worked on a few a few years ago um, was Read Excel. And one of the parts of Read Excel is reading uh, the X, XML files that modern versions of Excel create. And that's kind of another case where there's like a, a spec that describes exactly how the XML should be. Um, but it's an 800 page PDF and it's organized alphabetically by the tags that are used. So there's no like, there's no like kind of big picture, like here's the thing you've got to start with and inside of this is that and sort of that and you can kind of work your way down. Right. It's just a matter of like a lot of kind of skimming and, and um, picking up pieces. So I, so I think there's like always these sort of two tensions to me when I'm learning something like going to like, like this is the this is the theory, this is like the, the basis and kind of building my way up. And then also just like a bunch of like Googling and finding Stack Overflow questions and answers and random blog posts, which like solve kind of specific needs, which like help me, <laughs> like this is how you actually use it. And then sort of slowly like meeting my way in the, in the middle. Hey, 
Um, relevant to our group, uh, Maya asked, uh, we read Advanced R. Um, we're about to read our packages. Um, what would you recommend after that? Uh, what are the tool chains needed to call yourself an advanced R developer? And what concepts do you need to be super comfortable with if you wanted to, for example, start contributing to R core? I think after that, like a lot of it, if you want to become like a better programmer, a lot of it is reading kind of um, like general software development advice and building up your general software development skills that is not you know specific to R. Um, and, and there's not like that much written you know about software engineering and R. So I think you have to like start reading about you know stuff in other languages and figure out kind of how to translate them. Um, you know, I, I think if you're going to do that, like having some kind of basic kind of reading knowledge of other languages is useful. Um, you know, I think Python is a really good, like being able to read Python code, I think is really useful. Obviously, you know, Python is used a lot for data science as well, but there's also like a lot written about software engineering and uh, software development in Python. And so if you can like understand some Python, you can start to, you know, do this whole other literature that you can um, start to dip your toe in. And I think the, I mean, that part of that too is just being um, kind of comfortable, not knowing, being able to read a book and not know absolutely everything that's going on and kind of being comfortable with that, but still being able to like dive in and the places that you think are important to you, like figuring out what's going on and then just like not worrying too much about the rest of the book that you know, maybe doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Um, my kind of recommendations I have for uh, like general software development stuff are kind of um, out of date. I have some books that I let's see if I can find them. Um, where are they? One book that I read that was really useful for me when I was getting started was called The Pragmatic Programmer, which I do not know where it is on my bookshelf. <laughs> Um, but, oh, here it is, I get to my design tables. Um, this book, I really, it's a, you know, it's a little old now. I don't think it's necessarily dated because a lot of the principles are, um, you know, apply to any programming language or any task. Um, and that's, um, I think really helped me, um, I think that's probably the, the thing that be most that was useful to me that would be most useful to other people. Um, I think having some kind of basic knowledge of like different algorithms and what they're called can be useful. So when people talk about them or talk about big O notation, you've got some sense of what's going on. Um, but again, I think you have to you have to start reading outside of the of the R, R language. Makes sense. All right. Now I have a block that are a little bit more like into the nitty gritty of coding. Um, well, or related to that. So the first one we have from Tony, uh, why do you think the number of programming languages that implement uh, quasi quotation is so few? <laughs> um, that's a very specific <laughs> question. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, that's a good question. Um, I think part of it is because it makes like the traditional sort of job of programming languages, which, or the most popular job of programming languages, which is to produce like fast, like machine code, much, much harder. And it's a, it's sort of a feature that I think is most appealing to non-programmers, which are <laughs> generally the people who are creating, who people creating programming languages like don't really think about or kind of care about that much. So I think it's the sort of this mismatch, like it's a, it's a weird, it's weird, it's kind of complicated, it like adds ambiguity to the language and like unless you're doing like something that where you need this sort of interactive exploratory experience, it doesn't really help that much. Um, 
so I think uh, like R, it's, yeah, R is weird to be mm -hmm. in that situation, but I think it's really like a really, really good fit for R and why I think no other programming language, at least in existence today, can kind of give you the fluency of, of, of like interactive data analysis that R can. That makes sense. Um, and actually, this one's from me. Uh, is there anything you wish R did, but you haven't figured out how to add it to R? Um, hmm. And there's like always like little things <laughs> here and there that we find annoying, but nothing. I don't think there's anything major. Um, Jim, let's see if I can. Jim Hester had a nice talk at. Uh, the DSC a couple of years ago, and let me see if there's a line. Uh, yeah, there's some kind of like syntax ideas here. Yeah, I'll just put this in the chat. Um, that Lionel wrote quite a few years ago. Now that uh, and Jim Hester talked about some of these at a, uh, an R summit, which is one of the smaller conferences that a lot of R core um, attends that are now, I think, slowly percolating into R. And that's why in the next release of R, there might be like a native pipe and some more compact syntax for, for creating functions. Um, so I don't think there's anything like Major, I mean, I, I guess the thing that annoys me that happens to annoy me the most uh, is like Unicode support on Windows, which is a, a pain, um, which mostly just was mostly a pain for us because it causes um, random failures that we can't easily di diagnose because none of us really use Windows. But um, it's obviously more of a pain for people that do actually use Windows. That would just be nice if that was resolved somehow. But I, I think like by and large, anything that's, like important and easy to fix, like we've, you know, we've tried to fix. So it's just like weird, hard things that are left. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then uh, very specific, uh, as we were learning um, like Arlang and tidy evaluation through the book, it, uh, the question came out up, do you ever struggle with remembering um, syntax for Arlang and tidy evaluation? when to have a bang bang, when to in quo, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, most of the, the basic stuff, I still kind of, like this is like <laughs> fine because I've done it enough. And um, there's a few patterns <laughs> that like trip me up every time. And I like, I know that I at least have the sense that I'm like doing it wrong. And then I ask Leonel and he tells me how to do it <laughs> correctly. Um, <laughs> so like, absolutely. I think one of the, the thing that's, you know, great about having a, a you know, a team at our studios, we have like a Slack channel where we ask these questions and you can get help pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a bunch of stuff like that that I just don't, I do not have like loaded on my head and I have to like figure it out and like write some little experiments or like read whatever, I read something that I wrote in the past and no longer remember. <laughs> um, but that's like pretty typical. I think that's like one of the reasons that, um, you know, unit testing has become like more and more important part of my workflow. Like, I, I you know, I, I go to I go to can work on packages that I wrote, and it is literally like a stranger has written them because I have zero recollection <laughs> of like how the code works. Um, you know, you know, after a couple of days, it sort of starts to come back to me. But a, a lot of it is, you know, I, I just I you know I don't know it. I just have to figure it out. I you know Google I use Stack Overflow the same as everyone else. Yeah, that, that's good to hear. Um, so Jake asks, do you have any tips for debugging uh, dot, 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 and curly, curly when troubleshooting a function? And now I think those are very different questions, really. But um, yeah, I think that's one of the, like, the hard, <laughs> hard parts of these. I think these are like, like these are kind of like Heisen. They call it sometimes like Heisenbugs because of like Heisenberg's yeah. uncertainty principle from quantum <laughs> mechanics. Like as soon as you observe them, they change their behavior. 
And that makes like debugging them really tough because it takes a while. Cause you've got to like figure out like, are you looking at it the right way? Uh, Cause if you're not, you'll like build up this like mental model of what the underlying bug is. It's actually completely incorrect. It's actually a buggy, your buggy understanding of um, something else. So I don't think I have anything kind of particular in um, the dot, dot, dot and curly, curly, except that you have to be aware of this. Like you can't just look at them. You've got to use uh, an expert or substitute or something to capture the, the unevaluated thunk. Um, I think that the, the general principle is with, with debugging is to try and like, like question everything. Like if you cannot figure out why something is not working or like it's just utterly mystifying, it's probably because um, you've made, there's like some like fundamental assumption, incorrect assumption in your thinking and you have to like kind of drill down and, and figure out what that is. And that's really hard. And I think it gets, it only gets like slightly easier with experience. <laughs> um, I think the, the other part of it is just, accept, you just have to accept that there are some, um, you know, sometimes it just takes a long time and that's okay. And that's normal because there's a lot of stuff going on and you don't understand it all fully and you can't understand it all fully. And that's like, that's fine. And you just have to say, you have sometimes, you know, it's, totally normal part of a software developer's life to spend eight hours debugging something to find like a two letter mistake <laughs> and that's like nothing to regret that's just like that's life just have to accept it <laughs> it's good to hear but uh you agree basically that sometimes things are there's hard. a really um yeah. there was a really i think the best example of this um, there's a bug, there was a bug in Red Excel that took Jenny like three, I think it was pretty much three days to track down. And then the fix was a single character. Um, it was just like the perfect example that like the amount of effort you put in is completely independent of like the actual <laughs> code that comes out a lot of the time. Very true. All right. So next, um, Tony wants to know, uh, what did you learn from developing packages like um, like Prior and Lazy Evel, and uh, how did it, how did that inform development of Arlang? Yeah, I mean that's those are these packages that I have literally no idea <laughs> what they did now. Um, I don't know. I got the whole kind of journey. I think leading up to tidy evaluation was a series of these. Um, kind of flashes of insight where I'm like, ah, oh, yes, I finally, finally understood how it should all work. And then a year later, I'm like, oh, actually, that was a false epiphany. I don't really understand how it works. Uh, and you sort of see that like these sort of multiple attempts or these like multiple, like, like finally getting to kind of getting to grips with what the problems were. Uh, I think the other thing um, that, that took a while, particularly um, with tidy eval, is like figuring out like the the um, like it's particularly hard because not only did it need like a theory, like a sort of a deep theory that like you know experts could use to reason about what was going on, it also needed like a you know a relatively user friendly interface that. Um, you know, just casual eye users could take advantage of. I think that was the, that was the hardest thing. And it was, that, I think that didn't really happen until we got curly curly, which made like most of the problems um, like go away. So that, like, that was a really, um, I don't know, I mean, that, like, I, I think like, it's not clear, like what I learned from that, that could that go, go on to other, Problems, but I think there's there's this like one of the the things we we sort of think about a lot is how do we kind of get the right feedback from the right people at the right time, and it's the sort of struggle like when there's something like new, we're thinking about trying out like how do we like expose it to, you know, the the, the people in the art community are like excited about this and willing to try it out and are happy to live with the consequences if things break. Like how do we get enough of those people trying it out without like advertising it? So people who are like newer to R try it out and things go wrong and they end up with like broken and package installs on their systems. And um, like it just getting that, 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 that balance, right? Of kind of getting the, the right 
white feedback, I think, is one of the challenges. And like in, in most of the time, that's like only um, obvious in retrospect um, because it's hard, like when you are so deeply involved, like deeply invest, like invest isn't quite right, but when you're so deeply like in a, like a package, like everything's loaded in your head and that kind of all makes sense to you. It's only like when you come back to it six months later and you're like, I have no idea what I was thinking. I have no idea how any of this works. Does, um, do the, does that, yeah, does writing the books kind of help with that? I, I've noticed, like, I've seen things in Mastering Shiny where you write something in the book and then if you go look at Shiny, you've got an issue of, you know, make it yeah. work this way, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the books are, um, like that, that is like another really, <laughs> like one of the key ways that I learn stuff is to write <laughs> books about it. Um, I, I don't think that's a very <laughs> generalizable way of learning things. Um, but, but certainly that like taking, like trying to explain to other people what it, the, your understanding of a topic is like really great at like forcing you to nail down like all of the little bits that you don't understand um and it's gonna come up again okay um mastering shiny is kind of interesting because like compared to the other books um like advanced are uh, like that that's basically like and you know i i have no ability to change r itself so it's mostly advanced r is like me trying to understand what's going on and then wrap that up in abstractions where necessary to help make it easier for other people. Like R for data science, that's all 100% tidyverse. So whenever there's anything in the book that I'm like, oh, this is really annoying, I feel compelled to go and like fix it in the package. Whereas Mastering Shiny is kind of interesting because like, you know, by and large, you know, Shiny is well-designed package, but there's all these little rough edges and there's always this, I have to think like, is it better for me to like, is it easier to document this little rough edge or is it easier to like go and fix that rough edge so other people don't, don't encounter it? All right, um, somewhat related to that, uh, how do you think about future use scenarios or user assumptions when you're writing error and warning code in your uh, functions? Uh, errors are like really, really tough because um, I think errors are so tough because someone by and large gets an error when their mental model of the function is incorrect. And so for you to write a good error message, not only do you have to understand, like understanding how the function is supposed to work is like not that useful. You have to understand how people think the function is supposed to work. Um, and so I think some of it is you just have to like take a stab at it and then like people will complain about it and then you'll use that feedback to write an error message. Um, one of the things we've been doing more lately is um, having more of a style around error messages where um, rather than writing like sentences or paragraphs, it's more about like bulleted lists. So like always start with like, this is the problem and then give as much information for the context of the problem as possible, still kind of assuming that people are gonna use uh, traceback or a similar tool to find out exactly where the error occurred. And then um, if possible, like provide some hints about what the most like likely cause of the problem is. Um, hints are like a double-edged sword though, because if you give someone a hint and it's the wrong hint, like you've incorrectly guessed their intent, then you send them off on this like garden path that makes it even more confusing. Um, so that is just really, really, really tough. The other thing that's sort of interesting um, is that like, and then sometimes people will be like, well, I had this error and it's not anywhere in the documentation. And I think you should put it in the documentation which is like, you know, a totally reasonable thing to ask. But if every time you like added some documentation for every possible error that might come up, you end up with documentation that lists, like that's very, very long and that no one's gonna read. And so the net effect is that like, it, it doesn't help anyone anyway. So like trying to figure out like when, 
like how to respond to errors and how to respond to people's responses to errors is tough um, and something we still kind of, you know, struggle with. I think, yeah, I think the best thing, the only thing we can do or the best thing we can do is just be as consistent as possible. So that like you, that like there are some, like so if that, the same idea kind of keeps coming up in different places, you can recognize that in your code and hopefully like, recognize all oh, the same thing happened to me last time and now I need to do the same kind of thing this yeah. time but yeah it's really hard and it's really hard for me to like predict what people mm -hmm. are gonna do wrong just because you know I'm using R all the time I've written written the functions it's very very difficult to guess what people are gonna what people are gonna do to them to make mm -hmm. them make them sad yeah uh you have the the filter error message with when you use an equal instead of equal equal that's like my favorite error message in anything i think because it's exactly what i'm doing wrong every time it comes up so. yeah i mean that's a nice case we were like pretty certain yeah. of like what the what the problem is <laughs> um i think the, the other case like that's something that helps like remind me uh the other thing that is the, is really helpful is the um like when you when you pipe into ggplot2 instead of a plus and at least you get an error message saying did you mean to use the, the pipe it was useful the, the, although on the other hand like one other thing that comes up quite a lot um is like if you load plier after deep plier and then summarize will stop working in weird ways but if you do that there's specifically like this large message it's like five lines high the full <laughs> width of your screen that appears saying like like don't like you've loaded plier after dplyr, don't do this, bad things will happen. And yet like no one's or very few people seem to read that. <laughs> um, or, or at least make decisions based on that um, knowledge. So um, you know, it's tough. And like any anything that's displayed like frequently, um, people I think pretty quickly just become blind to. Uh, and I think the best example of this is if you ask people like, how do you cite R? Like what function do you call <laughs> to get a citation for R? Like the vast majority of people cannot tell you despite the fact that every time you load R, it tells you what function <laughs> to call. But you just, it's just like this wall of text and it comes up every time. So you just, you just ignore it. So like figuring out like, how do we avoid that? Uh, I think that's one of my favorite parts of use this is um so use this is a package we use for developing packages and it does some like potentially dangerous operations and before it asks you to before you it, it always asks you before it does anything potentially dangerous and it gives you like three choices there's like two no's one's yes they're in random order and it uses <laughs> like random ways of saying no or yes and the, and the attempt to actually like force you to like read the question before you just like hit hit yes. Um, yeah, I like so kind that. of using this all like psychological <laughs> tricks is is important. Definitely. Um, so how do you decide um, when a breaking change is worth the benefit that it will provide? Um, uh, so to, to answer that question, you have to kind of talk about like what a breaking change even <laughs> is, because that I think is a surprisingly tricky topic, because there's a lot of things that I would not qualify as being a breaking change that like still break people's code. Um, so for example, like sometimes fixing a bug, like if your code happens to rely on that bug, your code will now like break after the fact. Um, and that's, um, like for stuff like that, like I just, if, if it's something that we clearly consider to be a bug and you've accidentally depended on it, like we do not think about your feelings at all, basically <laughs> like that, that's, uh, that's a case we simply do not like consider because the, the, I mean, basically because we think the net benefit is that, you know, it's better to fix the bug, even if you accidentally depended on it. Uh, the subtler cases are like when um existing behavior changes uh and i think we have gotten like progressively more and more conservative about making changes um unfortunately i don't think 
So I think that like the proportion of people affected by breaking changes in the tidyverse has like steadily declined over the last five years. But the, I think the absolute number is still increasing because the <laughs> overall number of people using it is increasing faster than we become um, conservative. And, you know, at the heart, the sort of these breaking changes, I think, are a balance between like, do we want to support the current, like, do we want to help most the current users or the future users? Like current users obviously benefited by like having their code continue to work but future users are benefited by having like something that's more consistent and uh, easy to understand. So I, I think like we are slow, like by and large now we, we make relatively few, what we would consider to be breaking changes. Like we, we change the behavior of arguments rarely. We change the behavior of functions rarely, but we will add like new functions and new arguments and then deprecate or supersede um, old functions and it's still I think this is one of our like the biggest challenges of kind of communicating to people like what's safe for you to use and what's unsafe for you to use you should be like actively moving away from and one of the things um, so for example like um, we're using this new term called superseded to refer to functions like um, spread and gather and reshape so these are functions that we do not believe are the kind of the best approach anymore but we acknowledge that like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people rely on them. So we're never going to get rid of them. Um, and so we've been using this term like superseded for those functions. And I think still, unfortunately, like with dplyr and latest tidy, we superseded a bunch of functions and we failed to kind of communicate that. So people were like, oh, well, I have to go and change. I have to get rid of all my select if calls and all my calls to gather and spread. But like, that was not the case right. um, because they're going to hang around for, for quite some time. So just like figuring out like like how we kind of commit, how we communicate that to people, and how we um, like think about that ourselves. So, you know, there are other cases where we're like, you know. So I think the other the other big thing that's coming up is the Magruta, the new version of Magruta which is, has like a completely new implementation, which has some like big benefits. Like it's gonna be much, it's faster. Not that that makes much difference in practice. It gives you better back traces. The implementation is like much, much easier for us to understand and reason about, but it breaks some code. Um, all of the code that it breaks is code that when I look at it, I'm like, why on earth would you ever do that? Like, I have no, I have literally no mental model for what that code is going to do. Like, I could not predict what the output is. Um, but that, you know, that that's still like people have written it and it worked at the time. And like, how do we balance that? Like, like if some code in the wild is going to break, uh, we're pretty certain like that's relatively unusual code. Like it feels like it's like less than a tenth of a percent of users of pipe for even less than that of pipe in the wild. It's like really esoteric edge cases. And we believe like the net impact overall is going to be large and positive, um, you know, mostly because your trace backs are going to be much, much easier to understand when something goes wrong in the pipe. Um, but I don't know, like it's really hard to, um, like we can, it's, it's impossible to quantify that. And so we just have to go on our best kind of gut feeling like, like we think this is going to be a big win overall. Like we're trying to publicize as much as possible, trying to encourage people to give us feedback. But at the end of the day, like we have to make this judgment call that we think it's going to be worth it. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's tough. And it, you know, it sucks when we break people's code and we feel bad about it. But, you know, at the same time, we like, there's, there's some amount of breakage that's kind of inevitable so we can like move towards like the, the, the ideal path. Um, and another thing that's come up with like the test, the upcoming test that released, like I removed some bit of code inside of test that, that like I found really hard to understand. And it like totally breaks one package. Hmm. You know, they're like 5,000 tests that's used by like 5,000 packages and it breaks one of them, but it breaks it in a way that's very, very difficult to fix. Like, how do you kind of like balance that? It's really, really tough. And um, I think some of it is um, like, it's impossible to 
make everyone happy. And I feel like part of my job now is just to like, to accept that and to um, you know, listen compassionately to people when they have problems, but at the same time, like not to let that um, overly stop us from making the changes that need to be made. Right. It's, yeah, it's a tough <laughs> balance. Uh, yeah. So speaking of the new version of test that, um, you're working on that new version of test that, uh, you've got new editions of our packages and, um, you know, the book, our packages, the ggplot book, mastering shiny is coming out. Um, I assume other things that you're working on. How do you like, how do you juggle all that and still make forward progress? And again, most of it is like, well, it's like the Gigi Potsu book is mostly Thomas and Danielle making right. progress on it. So having like <laughs> excellent collaborators really helps. Uh, and then test that, like I, I've kind of like, I've already like mostly purged that from my brain to think about <laughs> DB Player. Um, so that, that I like, I find that um, like context switching is really expensive and really tough. And so I try and like pick like one or two kind of big projects to like make progress on and spend as much time as possible doing that. Um, so I, I do like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I, I almost, it's extremely difficult. There's extremely few situations in which I'll have a meeting on the Tuesday or Thursday. And so those are the days where I have like enough time to kind of load like complicated stuff into my head and, and make, make progress on it. Um, and that's really helpful for the big stuff like um, test that and, and DB ply where there's just like a lot of moving pieces that I have to, you know, think about simultaneously. Um, you know, I try and spend like an hour every day writing in the morning. I think that's like the, the secret such as it is to writing books is just to do, it's just to write the book. Um, <laughs> but like consistently putting in some amount of time. Like I have no idea. Like I seem to be able to do that, but I don't think anyone else I've given book writing advice to has ever succeeded. So it's clearly not sufficient to write a book. But like if you if you can do that, like I think that this like this sort of carving out big blocks of time is really useful for me. Finding like smaller blocks of time that I consistently use to work on a project. And then the other thing I find is like after working on a big thing like test that or DP plier for a couple of you know, weeks or a month, I'll just get like sick of it and exhausted of working on this like one big thing. And that is when I'll do like, I'll switch from doing that one big thing to a bunch of like smaller things. And I'll do like three or four like smaller package releases um, and just kind of get, and, and then that's just a matter of like having like three things all in various stages in my head. And that <laughs> that's hard, but I can do it for like a week as long as none of the, the problems are too big and, and get out a bunch of um, releases in a relatively short amount of time. And then, then that's just now, I think I'm much better at doing like minor releases of packages, like looking at the issues, fixing the things that I can fix easily, and then leaving the bigger stuff to like marinate for longer. Cool. All right. That is, we are through the questions that we collected through the Slack. So now I'm going to start pulling ones out of the chat. Um, okay. So first I have, uh, have you written any Julia? I have not written any Julia, although I've like read a decent amount about it and watched a few videos. I think, um, I, I think it's unlikely to be appealing to the vast majority of people who use, uh, like it's, I think it's like a beautiful, it seems like a beautiful, efficient programming language but it still has a lot, if you actually want to do data science, there are like a lot of pieces missing and there will be for quite some time. So if you're the type of person who's like really excited about like filling in holes in an ecosystem, like you discover like some important thing you need to do is missing and you're like, yeah, that's cool. Now I can have a stab at implementing it. I think Julia is great for that. Um, but if you just want to do like data science, it's just, like so many pieces missing. And then like all of the computational performance that you get from Julia, like by and large, I still think for like most data science, like the, the cost is like you figuring out what the heck you wanna do and like wrestling with the questions you wanna ask the data. 
And I think Julia is like more expressive than just about any other modern language out there, but still less expressive than R. So um, still any of the kind of like dplyr or ggplot2 like um, syntaxes have to be a little, a little clunkier than, than R. Fair enough. Um, and I guess somewhat related little uh, interlude that uh, this is a question from Darren. He says, I've seen Ross Ahaka talk about um, an R-like language that is somewhat more, a somewhat more static version of R. Do you see room for that? Do you have thoughts on that? Uh, I just, I think it's un that's unlikely to ever happen um, just because creating like, not only is creating a new programming language hard, but it's like building up the community around it. That's very, very tough. It's the same basic problem with like Julia, like sure the language might be like better on a bunch of like technical characteristics, but there's just nothing. Like when you start a language, there's like nothing there. <laughs> um, and so how do you like build up all of the packages, that whole ecosystem so you can actually do the stuff that you actually care about, not like the, the, the purity of the object oriented dispatch system. Um, and so I think anything like just to do that for, for like R, you would have to have like a bigger scope than just being like it's the more static version of R. Otherwise, like no one would, you know, effectively no one would use it and wouldn't get enough critical mass. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting to think about like are there kind of subsets of R that we could steer people towards? Is there some way we could have kind of like a dialect? of R that's maybe a little easier to optimize that like, you know, 90% of existing code um, could use or 95% could use with minor modifications. Um, or could we add some kind of gradual typing system to R that would eventually give, help us give better error messages and better documentation and maybe better performance. But again, like most of that stuff, it's all about improving the performance of the, the kind of computing, which, you know, is, is important, but it's just not my like primary focus. Like I care most about like, how do you optimize the kind of performance of the, the data scientist taking that whole thing, the whole like brain to computer to results. And just like most of what I do is not is still, the bottleneck is not the computer, the bottleneck is my, is my brain. And that, you know, that's what I'm mostly, mostly interested in. You know, that's not to say that all the other stuff is like super important, but I just not, what I do so much. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, is there going to be a GG plot for interact interactive graphics? And I think I've seen versions of this question before. <laughs> I think I'll refuse to answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I like. I think almost almost certainly there will be. Or well, I mean, there there is for some definition of that already. I think like GG plotly is pretty. Cool and GG, um, GGI graph, GG rabbits, yeah. the, uh, David Go. Like, there's a there's a few, um, there's a couple of existing packages that take like a GG plot two plots and add like a smidgen of interactivity to them. But uh, I think the idea, I still like the idea of a grammar of interactive graphics. Uh, I think it's something that like Thomas and Peterson is likely to work on at some point. It just still doesn't feel like the most you know, pressing problem right now. Fair enough. Um, let's see. That, that's sort of an interesting. I, one thing that I think about though, that it's like hard to balance. Like when you, we've, we've started using relatively recently using Google Analytics and all the Tidyverse websites. So we know how many people hmm. like look at various documentation pages and some of them like the geon point documentation, like, you know, 20,000 people are looking at, looking at that a month. So if you want like some high leverage way to make an impact, like looking at that page and improving the documentation is a really like that, that's a way that like pays off in the short term in a way like creating a grammar of interactive graphics. That's like a multiple you know, probably multiple year process that's going to take five to 10 years to pay off. And thinking about like that balance of like what we work on in the short term and what we work on the, in the long term is, um, is challenging too. Uh, 
All right. Um, I'm trying to read through real quick. So I think we have time for just one or two more. Um, <laughs> well, I like this one from Maya who started our club. So possibly give her the last question. Uh, as a club, we've come up with lots of cool but useless functions, packages, et cetera, to apply these concepts. And you've come up with so many actually useful tools. What are the types of questions you should ask yourself as a developer in order to create tools that aren't just cool, but would actually benefit people? Yeah, I, I think part of it is like reflecting on like what are things that are like legitimate frustrations for you? Uh, like things in your workflow that feel like painful. And I, I think the thing that's really challenging about this is that anything, um, like even if something is painful and you do it all the time, you very quickly become kind of immune to the pain so that you don't notice it. And it's very hard to like look at something and say, this is harder than it should be. But I think that's what you have to, you have to kind of cultivate that sense for like, like, why does this, like, why was it so hard for me to do this thing? Like, was it really because the problem was um, legitimately uh, that difficult? Or was it because there's something about like the current, the current set of functions that, that, that make it challenging? Like, when am I getting like knocked out of the flow of programming? So that I have to think about what I'm like the the mechanics of what I'm doing rather than the kind of the bigger picture of what I'm doing. Um, I think it, it, at the same time, I think it's important like not to be like too hard on yourself. Like it's very easy to look at stuff like you know dplyr and ggplot2, which are you know now you know the product of like decades of <laughs> you know person hours of of work, and like you it just doesn't you know, it's going to take you a while that you get to the point of that. Like, don't, you, you, you can't hope to, like, tackle something that big. You've got to, like, find, like, smaller things that, you know, affect you and then think about, like, what are, like, other people, like, you know, what is the, the general case of this problem? Like, what other sorts of people are likely to be suffering from this? And then I think the other thing that's important to, um, recognizes that like it doesn't matter how um good your stuff is unless like people actually know about it and thinking a little bit about like marketing and how do you kind of advertise what you're doing so the people that that people that need to know about it like find out about it and a lot of that is just like saying the same thing kind of again and again and they, and again and again in like slightly different ways it just takes a lot it takes a long time for people to to kind of like learn new stuff and find out about it and you know you've got to figure out where the people that you want to reach out to like hang out and then you know approach them approach them there rather than making them come to you that that is really good advice and i think that's a really good one to end this on um if anyone has something super like high importance say it now in the chat but uh i think that is everything that or the bulk of what we had asked uh, i just want to thank you again this was great um yeah we're getting lots of thank you thank you in the chat um and uh yeah it's been a pleasure <laughs> cool thanks for having me thank you enjoy your weekend everyone <laughs> bye bye